Today we're going to show you how Roy installed the electrics in the van. Because right. <laughs> it would be nice to be able to get some of this powery stuff. Powering our tea in the morning. Okay. Step one, put the battery in the van. Jesus. Was it 55 kilos thing? Uh, yeah. Okay, keep going, keep going, keep going, bit of wood. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Down. And down. Nice. While I am waiting for all the stuff related to the bed platform to set, I thought I'd work on the electrical system. So, some of it's temporarily installed. So this is the giant lithium battery, 48 volt server rack battery. It's going to go there, but installed in a slightly less, uh, in a slightly less farmery fashion. And over here in this area is going to be where the lovely blue box expensive thing, the Victron charge controllers, inverters and all that kind of stuff is going to go. So I'm going to mock up all of the Victron stuff on the floor here so I know how much, so I know how much space everything is going to take and then start wiring things up. I've already powered up the Victron inverter inside. It took me three or four hours to actually get connected to it properly. That was not so great. And I've run all the big power cables. So the two chunky battery cables are running through the section of the van to where the inverter is going to be. And I've got an extra cable run here for all, uh, any other cables and accessories which need to go between here and the battery. So running through this third duct here, I have a custom made cable, which is the uh, CAN bus BMS communication between the Victron and the battery. And just the hell of it, I don't think I really need it, but I've just run the, uh, the thermistor through as well. So that plugs onto here. Might as well have the temperature sensor on the battery. Can't do any harm, even though theoretically it'll protect itself. What you'll find is I've actually done something a few times. You actually start to get reasonable at it. And one thing that I discovered is when crimping these electrical connections is not to go at it just in like sort of one go. Don't just squeeze the handles together in one fell swoop and think it's going to be good because what's happened is it's sort of like the crimps extruded out the side and got pinched inside the crimping tool. Now these are the correct size, definitely the correct size crimps for this cable. So something with the technique or the crimping tools, but I can show you how I stopped that from happening. So I'm going to crimp it a little bit, go, I don't know, a third of the way or so. But then before you go too far, release it from the tool and twiddle it around by sort of one notch. It'll make sense if you actually do it. Twiddle it around by one notch. And I found doing it in at least three goes sorted it out. I think I can do this in three. Let's see. Yeah, that'll be fine. And if you look at that now, this has now got no weird extruded horrible bit. It's just really nicely on there. And then to finish these all off nicely, I'm adding some heat shrink because heat shrink makes electrical things automatically 10 times better. This is nice dual wool, st uh, dual wool stuff with uh, adhesive inside it. Wait for that to cool, then I'm gonna add another layer. And just like that, all the main cables are done. So we have two cables feeding battery power to the Victron. We have a chassis ground. And on this side, we have the two battery cables. There's one, there's one, and there's the other. I'm gonna start thinking about actually getting the uh, Victron, on, Victron in here and seeing, seeing what happens. Royson from the future note about the pre-charge circuitry on the SOK batteries. How you use it with everything connected and your DC isolators turned on, but the BMS and battery turned off. You turn on the battery, firstly on the breaker and then by holding the reset button. It then pre-charges the capacitors in the inverter using its own built-in resistor network. 
and everything is safe. It's charging at 2,000 watts. Nice. I might go and plug in my hair dryer. That's very exciting. Yes, that's Shall the most we important bit. Shall we celebrate with a plum crumble? Oh, a plum. That's a very good idea. A plum ball. Plum ball, plum ball, plum ball, plum. Plum ball, 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 plum
I'm going to be doing the final talks on all the battery connections and multiprocessor connections and all that kind of stuff. And a common problem with this is you don't have the, a torque wrench or you don't have the right torque wrench. I've got torque wrenches, but they don't go down to a low enough value for these. They're more like mechanics stuff for cars and things. So how to do it? Well, it's quite easy, really, if you've got some scales. So what I have is a little spreadsheet on my phone where I have all the torques listed and I want 13 Newton meters. So at the top here, I've written down 13 Newton meters. And then I need to know how long the thing I'm going to be doing the torquing with is, which is 42 centimeters. So with those two bits of information, I stick 42 centimeters in here and it says, I need 3.2 kilograms of force in order to be able to meet, meet that torque value. That is off. So the battery is off uh, because you are using metal tools around a potentially live battery, which should be bad news if you shorted it out. So firstly, I'll just get it roughly tightened because there's no point messing around. If you're wondering why this is so long, it's because my scales only go up to five kilos. So I need something long enough that I don't max out the scale. So I'm aiming for 3.2. 3.2. And that's it. No having to buy a 60 quid torque wrench. So long as you've already got some scales, that is. So in summary, where have we got to today? Well, all of these lovely boxes are permanently mounted, as far as I can tell they're not going to come off again, permanently mounted to the van. The battery is tested and working well, I've done all the main high, high current battery cabling, that's all permanently in as well. We have now a proper AC feed going in to a breaker box with RCD and circuit breaker protection, feeding the Victron properly as opposed to how it was before. And we are now at the stage where I can start wiring AC out into the AC breaker panel. Not bad going as well. Okay. Again, as always, way slower than I thought it would be, but I was doing some other things today as well. Like for example, a Chineseium reversing camera. Looking resplendent, ducting the solar cables nice and tucked away, ready to get plugged into the smart solar charge controller. And yeah, we'll go over this whole installation in detail later. I am aware that I haven't abided by Victron's 10 centimeter around for the clearances. It'll be fine. Well, I said I was going to stop today, but I didn't because I was too excited to get mains power in the van for the very, very first time and genuinely haven't tried this yet. The inverter is inverting. Power hasn't gone any further than this yet. The thing which worried me was the inverter, when you go across live and neutral of the inverter shows, shows a short circuit, which is like verboten, never. That's really bad. But I think it's just because of the way it does its power inversion. It's, it hasn't blown up and it was showing us a short circuit across live and neutral on the inverter out terminals. I guess that's normal then. It would have blown up by now already. So, breaker on, RCD on, breaker on, socket, plug, <laughs> we have lights, we have mains power. Oh, yeah, look at that. So I'm very happy with that. Tomorrow, tea in the van. In case anyone's interested, because I know I would be. This is the internals of the SOK 48 volt, 100 amp hour serve rack battery. The reason I got the cover off is one, I was just curious because isn't it pretty? Pretty pretty. But what I noticed was there was a disagreement between what the battery said its total output voltage was 
and the MultiPlus and my multimeter. It's only off by 0.6 volts, but you know, I wanted to see where that came from. I was, I was concerned that one of the BMS values for the cells is, is incorrect, or basically I was worried that this unit was measuring one or more of the cell voltages inaccurately. So I've checked each individual cell with the multimeter. That's very easy, I'll show you how that's done. So it's literally a case of, you know, I don't know which cell is which, but there are 16 of them. I'm just doing it in a consistent order. So I just go bang, bang, 3.370, doop, doop, 3.354. I've done that for all 16 cells. I'm now gonna write down all the BMS values for the cells. What this battery is doing is it's adding up all of the individual cell voltages and then using that as a reported entire battery voltage. But you can imagine 16 individual readings, there's cumulative error building up over that, which is where I think that 0.6 overall pack voltage difference comes from. So I don't think it matters, but I'm just gonna quickly compare all these individual values I've taken with the BMS and see if there's any that look out of whack. For those playing along at home or interested, the biggest cell deviation between my fluke and individual measurements on these cells was 17 millivolts. That's good enough.